We are delighted to welcome our next speakers, Helmi Schof and Caroline Franco from Böhringer Ingelheim. Helmi is the Head of Ethics and Compliance MIDI region and Caroline is the Ethics and Compliance Manager. They support both Böhringer Ingelheim businesses, human pharmaceuticals and animal health in what they call the MIDI region, composed of 11 European countries. They both are creative, tech-savvy and have a consulting background. They are invested in improving patient and animal health care by inspiring business to work with integrity and passion. Their objective? Making compliance easy to own. So I would like to start with a short disclaimer that this presentation is our own opinion and not necessarily the ones of uh, Böhringer Ingelheim. Also, we want to uh, really express our gratitude to Unsplash for the usage of their pictures. So first of all, compliance blockbuster, how to engage people for even the most complex compliance topics. Have you ever um, been in the situation you needed to do a training? It's an interesting topic. Uh, you're excited, um, it's super relevant for your audience, so you also expect your audience to be super excited, engaged, um, and then, um, so you do your presentation, um, and during your presentation you have a look and you actually see people like looking at their mobiles or doing stuff in between. Um, I'm not sure if this sounds familiar to you, but it has happened to me uh, multiple times. And I would like to tell you a story about something that happened to me in the past. Um, I was working as a consultant and a uh, client had asked us to, um, uh, to harmonize the compliance program for a newly formed region. Um, so we looked into the compliance programs that were existing in the, in the countries. Um, we looked at synergies, ways for enhancement, Uh, we created a couple of scenarios uh, which we presented also to, to the client, um, also to the regional head. Um, they were really interested, had a clear preference for one of the scenarios. And then the regional head said like, oh great, um, I really love this scenario, could you please uh, present it to my compliance uh, or to my general managers? So I went to this meeting with the general managers Uh, I presented my compliance program, um, explained what it would entail, what it would mean to them, the pros and cons, etc. The GMs really hated it. It was really a very bad presentation. Um, and some even left a bit frustrated, had concerns, and I also left frustrated because I prepared everything with the client, with the regional head. The regional ha head was happy, so if she was Uh, why weren't the general managers in the countries happy? And because this was really a bad experience, I really needed to take a step back and think about like, well, what, what happened? Um, so I had a good thought um, and I realized like, I just went into the meeting, straightly presented my compliance program. I did not build any rapport with the audience, did not make a connection. Um, and even though I was of the impression that I um, met their needs, um, that I had an understanding of their needs, they clearly expressed that they didn't feel that way. Um, which also made me wonder, like, to what extent do they really understand what I was presenting? And as it was a really bad uh, meeting, um, I also went to uh, an HR business partner to discuss, like, well, how can I improve? And he told me, "Help me! Uh, next time you go to the general managers, you do a story, and um, you explain like um, uh, the story should represent like the concerns that the GMs have, and also explain like how you address those concerns." So I went back into another meeting with the GMs, and I explained like, "Hey, sorry, uh, last time uh, you may have." gotten the impression that I'm trying to build this super uh, fancy, very expensive uh, compliance sports car. And I know that's not what you're looking for. That was also not our intention to do. We actually were trying to build a um, plain and simple compliance bus. And this bus can take all of the countries from A to B, B being our efficient uh, compliance program. 
Um, so that would avoid the need of all the countries to build this very um, expensive uh, sports car. Um, so it would save a lot of uh, resources, a lot of costs. And this time the general managers were really happy. Uh, they felt that their needs were addressed. And this was particularly interesting for me because I, really, I didn't really change the compliance program. The only thing I changed was the way that I presented it. So for me, this was really one of these eye-opening moments um, that I discovered like, wow, if I just change the way that I present something, it really can change the outcome of a meeting completely. And I was like, well, if I can do this with just telling a story, um, what more can I do with this newly discovered superpower? Thank you, Henry, for sharing your story. I think all of us can relate to this. Indeed, when we present compliance topics, sometimes our audience is not really excited. And I like to think of compliance information that we have to share a bit like a Lego box. At first, the Lego box is a bit messy with a lot of pieces, a lot of colors, and we don't really see the bigger picture. So what, what we do as compliance professional is that we try to organize the box, the pieces, right? We group per topic, anti-corruption, insider trading, etc. Then sometimes we try to do visually attractive presentation with pictures or headlines that are catchy. Sometimes we even group topic and start to build the Lego box really, for example, to explain to our colleagues how to deal with competitors or how to interact with public officials. But for the most complex compliance topics, this is not enough because our audience still miss a meaning, a context. And that's where storytelling comes into place. Okay, slide. And that's the spaceship that you can see on the screen. That's really bringing a story to life in order to explain to your audience a complex topic. And I would like to walk you for an example. Let's say you're a new compliance officer in a, in a new company and you have to explain compliance. What will you say? Well, in the past, I used to explain compliance this way. I used to say that we are professional working with laws and regulation and that we help the company assess the risk and opportunities linked to our behaviors. We create standard operating procedures, SOPs, and trainings so that everybody can understand the compliance setup and the risks. And we do all of this to help the company reach its objectives compliantly. Well, while this is a nice story, a nice picture, half of the room will not be able to summarize this in two weeks. They will forget about it. And more dangerous even, they might conclude, well, she showed risk and actually she's a compliance police. She's just going to come after me when I go too close to the red. This is why nowadays I love to explain compliance with a story. And this is a story I really like. As compliance people, we are with all employees on the boat. So our company is represented by the boat. And we have one objective, which is it's sunny island. It's a nice objective and it can depend on your company objectives. It can be to be number one in your industry, it can be to increase your sales by X million in revenues. It can also be to save lives, depend on your mission. But no matter what is your ambition, you have to navigate through the sea. And there are a couple of obstacles to reach your sunny island. It can be an anti-corruption sharks, it can be an insider trading tornado or a storm. And how do you deal with that? Well, there are a lot of tools in the company actually. There are standard operating procedures that can be compass or maps or checklists. And all of this help you to navigate safely to the sunny island. And that's what we do as compliance. We help you navigate to the sunny island. And by having such a, a story, you actually reach to your colleagues in a subconscious level, and they are more, more likely to contact you, actually, when they face some troubles in the sea. Now you might be really interested to know how to create such stories. You don't need to be creative or so, or a little bit, but Helmi is going to walk you through the three steps method that we have developed. Yes, so indeed, um, we've defined three steps um, to help you like craft really compelling compliance stories. I'll first uh, tell you how to start, uh, then what potential stories would be, um, and also to how to tell the story. Um, so first of all, how to start. Um, so for instance, um, you, of course, you need to present a certain compliance topic. So um, it could be that you've recently created um, 
a new SOP and standing operating procedure for antitrust together with the training and some awareness material. So you think about like the SOP training and awareness. Well, these are all, of course, mitigating measures. Um, and then you think like mitigating measures, um, what exactly, um, like take a step back and then you think like, what does it exactly entail? Um, what do they represent? Uh, what do they mean? Um, how do they relate uh, to you, to your stakeholder, to the company, etc.? cetera? Um, and then you could uh, think like, well, uh, mitigating measures, that's actually a sort of uh, defense, for instance, um, by having this SOP in place, we protect the company. Or you think like, well, by having this um, uh, training in place, we give a tool to, the, uh, to our colleagues um, so that they feel empowered to um, go out and do business in a compliant manner. And then when you think about like tools and defense, um, you start trying to make like brainstorming, make more associations. So think about like what pictures do you get in mind? Um, how would you explain this to a child? And if you then think about defense, um, you could, for instance, think about like a bow and arrow, a shield, superpowers, etc. Um, whereas if you think about tools, you could think about constructing, constructing nails and hammers, cutlery, uh, maybe you think about empowerment, you also draft into the superpowers that you thought of before. So a thing that could come into your mind is like uh, the spinach and Popeye. Um, you know, Popeye, like whenever he eats spinach, uh, he becomes super, uh, super strong, he can do anything. And that's also actually how your uh, training helps. Um, by doing the training, it's like the spinach for Popeye, so your uh, colleagues will become mentally super strong and can like, do business in a very compliant manner. So that's actually um, a little bit the technique that you need to get yourself familiar with. And you need to think about like, what stories can I tap into? And you can then look into, like, do I see any elements uh, that remind me? It could be like day-to-day um, uh, day to day situations like cooking, if it's something process related, could also be like uh, going to the dentist, not the nicest thing, but sometimes it must be done and you'll feel better afterwards. Could also be that you have an interesting movie that you think of or a new series like uh, the new James Bond movie, for instance, or you've been uh, reading the uh, Lord of the Rings book. It could also be that there's currently a big event uh, going on, like the Oktoberfest uh, you could use, but also like the UEFA Championship, Olympics, the Eurovision Song Contest. There's many things that you could use. Of course, uh, when creating these stories, context is key. And there's really some principles to keep in mind. And first and foremost, it's audience, audience, audience. Um, think about your audience. Uh, what are the challenges um, that the audience has. Um, what is the ambition of the audience? How does your topic relate to this ambition um, that they have? Um, if you know the audience very well, you may also know their sense of humor. If you can use humor, like humor is like super glue. It makes anything stick to your brain. Um, but if you do not apply it correctly, it really ruins everything. Like if people don't get the joke, they're only frustrated, they'll do not remember your story and actually it's counterproductive. So um, if you can use it, like great, but do not feel forced to use it. Um, and what is also important is that a story, um, it must of course resonate with yourself. You need to be excited about the story and it needs to resonate with you. But even more important, it needs to resonate with your audience. Um, as an example, uh, personally, I'm a big fan of football, um, even in spite of the Dutch team never performing really well. Um, but um, so I would, uh, I generally like to use something related to football. Um, also, if I know that my audience is into football. Um, but if I'm presenting, for instance, to a US audience, the European football championships probably doesn't really resonate with them. 
So then you need to think about, well, what could resonate to them, which might be American football, for instance. So you need to really keep in mind, like, what is my audience? What will resonate with them? And how does my, uh, how does this story help uh, with the message that I'm trying to convey? Thank you, Henry. And the last step to create interesting stories is actually how to tell the story. So there are a lot of literature out there on how to write stories. I like the one on the slide right now from Joseph Campbell, who wrote in the 50s how stories are written always the same way in Greek mythology. There are 12 steps, and we summarize them for you. The first step is always to set up the scene, set up the situation. We are on a boat. And then the ambition. What do we want to achieve? We want to reach this sunny island. However, there are some conflicts on the way that makes the journey interesting, actually. There are anti-corruption shark inside a trading tornadoes. What do we do with this? Well, we have the resolution. For each conflict, we have a solution. For example, a compliance tool. And that makes the hero, the compliance officer in that example. Once you have found a story that works, it's really important to use it um, constantly. But you really have to find a story that matches your audience, as Helmi was explaining. So navigating will not work with everybody, but I know that superheroes are really liked nowadays. So we can also use the Batman example. So let me show you. As employees, we are all in Gotham City. And our objective is to keep all habitants of the city safe, even the most vulnerable one, especially this one. But some behaviors, like the one of the Joker, keep us away from this. But luckily, we have a lot of tools, like the Batmobile that you can see on the screen or the utility belt. And that's what we do as compliance. We keep the city safe. So as you can see, the possibilities are really endless with this methodology. Once you find something you like and that resonates and that works in your company, I really recommend to stick with it for a while. Do not create a new story every time you present a compliance topic. Then you, it will not stick with people. Um, and I like a lot using the same story for different parts of the compliance program. For example, let's go back to our navigating story and let's use it for risk assessment. So, risk assessments are always a tricky moment for a company. People are getting stressed, there will be rankings, and they don't always understand what we do as compliance. Therefore, this story is quite nice. We can explain them that when we assess risk, it's a bit like assessing the risk of a boat catching fire due to a lightning strike. How do we do that? Well, we look at the likelihood. How likely is it actually that a fire will be creating, created from a lightning in the boat? And how bad will it be if that happened? That's the impact. Will we lose people? Will people die? Will we have to redo the entire boat? How much will it cost? That's what we call the gross risk. By multiplying the likelihood and the impact, we understand better in which waters we are navigating, really. And then, luckily, we have also controls in the company. We have a lot of things to avoid that actually a fire will happen. For example, lightning rods that take the electricity out of the boat when we are hit by lightning. And by deducting to the gross risk, the controls, we get our net risk. And that's our true risk to operate, given the different controls we have in the company. And I really like to use even the metaphor up to the risk rating and to stay away from explaining the risk with colors, you know, like red, orange, yellow, because people want everything green, of course. This is how we have been raised. And this is why I like to use risk rating with fish, for example. Um, is it a shark that we are speaking about, or is it piranhas, or is it actually an okay fish and we are fine to have this fish around our boat? This is not going to make it sink. And this is a very nice way to speak about risk in another manner and to really reach your colleagues in a subconscious level and to make your message stick. As you can see, I'm really enthusiastic about storytelling. I think it gave me superpowers and it makes my message stick to the audience. It creates meaning and context. However, I did not always think that this was a good idea to start with a story. I thought it was maybe a bit childish and that some upper management will not appreciate going straight into the compliance topic. However, I was lucky enough to have colleagues like Henry showing me that actually the message message stick better, and I really think that we all remember more the spaceship of the beginning than the Lego box that I showed. 
So, uh, thank you. So, I can also completely relate to this being a bit scary um, at first. Um, like when my HRBP told me, like, start with a story, I was like, what? Um, but, like, if you practice and uh, you do it more, like, it's really, um, if you have people in the business that start using your story, start use it, try, uh, speaking, for instance, about navigating or about Batman, for instance, it's really nice if you've inspired them and they really start to see you as their business partner. And also for the team, like I think many uh, compliance people uh, prefer to be a Batman or to prefer to be a navigator as opposed to being a police officer. So I think for many people, it's more inspiring and it gives indeed a certain meaning to, to their job. Um, so we really hope that with this presentation, um, you feel that you've uh, received certain uh, tools um, to go on this journey. Um, also that you feel that you have yeah, a couple of safeguards uh, to take the first steps, that you feel empowered. Um, and I wish you a lot of courage um, and also a lot of fun creating your own stories. Thank you so much. I'm not sure if there's any hey, questions. Hey, Caroline, thank you so much for your inspiring stories. I really enjoyed that, especially the heroic journey. A couple of questions. Can you apply storytelling to all situations? That's a good question. Um, of course, it's difficult uh, to apply. Like, of course, you can apply to all situations, but it's not that we do a storytelling each and every time. But it does provide a certain branding, um, and you can use it as a start up, as a warm up for your audience, of course. Okay. And how is storytelling received amongst your colleagues? Yeah, actually pretty well. <laughs> people enjoy it. And yeah, sometimes we, yeah, people even ask us, okay, which kind of stories do you have for us today? And that's yeah. really great to hear as compliance professionals. It's okay. a bit our brand now that people also expect it. Like when we do something, they're like, oh, there's going to be a story, um, which also sets the bar sometimes high. But it's also nice that you're inspiring people. Okay, we have a question from Reinhard Puntigam. Thank you for sending your question, Reinhard. How do you deal with the impression that compliance procedures are often received as an extra burden on company innovators so that, company is, so that compliance is a burden? <laughs> the bottom line of the heroic journey is that the hero ignores rules to find a solution. <laughs> Who would like well, to answer that? <laughs> I can give it a try. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And clearly, you know, standard operating procedures are for the most common things that we the most common activities that we do. And that, because we have standard operating procedure, it's easy to do repetitive tasks. Then we have more time actually for innovators and to speak with them and to exchange on, okay, you have this great idea. How are we going to do it? How are we going to tackle that? And then we hope that they come to us for a solution because there are solutions for innovation and we don't want to block that, of course. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, another question from, I can't quite read it here. Okay, I'll, I'll wait till the, that comes up in the screen. So can you give a, me an example of perhaps where a story didn't work? Yeah, I think you had a yeah. very nice example <laughs> we were of speaking one. about it uh, before. I, I don't play tennis, but I, used, I, I tried to use a story about tennis because I thought that's nice. There was Roland Garros going on. I thought nice in the news topic. And I wanted to speak about gray areas. So how the ball is sometimes in or out or sometimes on the line and then you need to assess. But I didn't know on which line to put the ball. So actually, I put it on the wrong line. And then people got so caught up on these details yeah. while they all understood the meaning behind. But I think that's something to really keep in mind, that people might get caught up. And then it's important to stop the conversation and move on, Okay. I think. Thanks yeah. for that example. <laughs> we have a question from Sophie Romaniello. Inspiring presentation. Thank you. In your stories example, you present the compliance officer as the hero. Oh, yeah. But isn't each employee a hero, protecting the company by doing the right thing? Yeah, we can only agree to that, uh, yeah. indeed. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all indeed. Batman in that uh, respect. Yeah. Okay, so from one situation where you, you gave a good example of a story didn't work, what has been your most successful story? I think one of the most successful stories, like one that we often go to is navigating, which is a bit of uh, the brand that yeah, we often use. 
Um, I think also monitoring, we used a very nice example, which is something which is very abstract and people never seem to understand what monitoring is, but we had a nice like real life day to day activity that we compared it to and that also yeah, made it stick that people seem to yeah, come to understand like, oh, that's what they mean. Okay, do you have other tools other than storytelling to engage people in compliance? Yes, we love to use gamification, for example. Mm -hmm. We love to use polls or interaction. Um, yeah, interactive presentation, I think, is a good way. Yeah. yeah. And how often do you think you need to come up with new stories to engage your audience? Well, <laughs> well we try, like, I would uh, advise to, like, of course, if there's something current, uh, like the Roland Garros or something, you can, of course, stick to, like, you can use that. Uh, but other than that, as Carol has also showed, like if you have a certain brand, um, like the navigating theme, you can really reuse it for different purposes. So you you provide a new angle. So you don't need to use, like you don't need to be stressed out of a new story every week or something. Like you can really reuse things. Um, and of course, at some point, if should they grow bored of it, then uh, you can change. But it's more up to your liking as well. Okay, we have a question from Rebecca Schmidt. Thank you, Rebecca, for engaging today. You've had a couple of questions from you, so thank you very much. How do you make sure that the stories are universal and that they resonate with everybody in an international corporation? Yeah, yeah. because then you have a cultural topic. How does it resonate with everyone? Yeah. yeah, there's no story that will always resonate with everybody. Um, but that's why I also stated like audience, 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 like your context is key. Um, and then you need to stay, like, really try to find something which is also a bit more universal stories. I think, like, uh, now the James Bond movie, for instance, that is out in the cinemas, which is also worldwide, like, really use worldwide themes. Uh, no controversial uh, things. Um, but that's, like, yeah, that's something you need to, to think about, like, what resonates at least with many people. And, of course, all the big stories do. Disney, also perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And in case of doubt, I just like to run the story for yeah. a few people, like uh -huh. different backgrounds, different right. stories, different departments, even. Yeah. Because let's not forget that in our companies, different departments yeah. have different visions. Mm -hmm. So it helps also to try the stories out. That's yeah. a very good point. Thank you, Caroline. From Roma Roquette, we have a question. Thank you for this presentation. Very inspiring. Do you have any book to recommend on storytelling? Well, that's a good question. Like the Joseph Campbell that I, I quoted before is a good one. It's from the 50s, so it's not really new. But <laughs> no. it, yeah, the way we tell stories is actually really old. And yeah, I think there are a lot out there. I don't know. Yeah. Helmi, anything you would like to add to that? Um, no, for me also, it's really, I think um, it's, you can of course read books and that's interesting. Um, but for me, practice. Right. Practice, practice, practice. And like Caroline also mentioned, like start small, start within your own team. Um, I would more recommend to really give, to really try. Mm -hmm. Do you ever use real life stories like the one we've heard today from Bradley Birkenfeld? Yeah, we do, right? Um, for example, the monitoring example that Helmi was referring was really about her going to the supermarket, actually. And, yeah. well, I think in a lot of countries, they change the traditional cashier to a machine. Mm -hmm. And then you have this attendant checking every couple of customers. Well, that's monitoring. And mm -hmm. that's really basic daily life mm -hmm. experience, yeah. And it's really fun because then we are in the supermarket making Taking pictures of each other. <laughs> and, like, it's also, it, we find that it really makes um, our work a lot more fun. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for your stories. I've really enjoyed your presentation today. Thank you Thank for coming to the studio today. Thank you. All the best.